Y bueno, y para comenzar, eh, a, a Joshua lo conocí en, justamente en Harvard, en julio, que hicimos el programa, y me pareció un tema apasionante, no solamente a nivel mundial, por lo que estamos viviendo, sino también en México. Eh, el tema de los medios está transformando la forma de consumir las noticias, las eh, fake news, eh, todo lo que hoy estamos consumiendo de una forma o de la otra, cómo los medios están cambiando, cómo hay medios digitales nuevos que están creciendo y que se están desarrollando muy muy fuerte y que están generando muy buena información también y que va a transformar la forma en la que nosotros vamos a consumir todas las noticias y la forma en que ya lo estamos consumiendo, ¿no? más allá del país de publicidad que se empieza a distribuir en los diferentes medios de forma eh, un poco más diferente de lo que, de lo que habíamos visto anteriormente. Eh, yo, eh, Joshua es el fundador y el director del Neiman Journalism de, eh, de la Universidad de Harvard. Es una persona y es el lab, está experimentando y está investigando constantemente qué es lo que está pasando, cuáles son las tendencias. Eh, y, y bueno, quería compartirles con ustedes esto, este tema, invitándolo directamente. Me acuerdo que el día que terminé de verlo en, en Harvard, dije, me encantaría que pronto esté en México y por suerte eh, lo, pude, lo pude hacer realidad. Así que, nada, bienvenidos de nuevo, bienvenidos al, a la casa de, de Isli. Eh, bienvenidos a los que ya son parte y a los que no, vengan porque el ecosistema digital es muy divertido, es muy entretenido y, eh, y es la única forma de entender las tendencias hacia futuro, no solamente acá en México, sino a nivel global. Y por favor recibamos un fuerte aplauso a Joshua Benton. to Google Mexico for, for hosting us. Uh, I, I will say up front, it's very difficult to talk about the disruption of the journalism business without talking about Google. So Google will come up a few times, but in a, in a spirit of friendship. And, and, uh, um, let me start off by just asking a, a question I, I like to, you know, whenever I, people are outside the United States, I like to ask this question. It's good we're in the morning. So far, how many of you have gotten news from a printed product today? A newspaper? Not only, there are a few of you, but you don't seem proud. You're like, yeah. <laughs> uh, How many of you have gotten news from television today, so far? Okay. How many of you have gotten news on a laptop or a desktop, a regular PC or Mac? Okay. And how many of you have gotten news on your phone so far today? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you are getting news on your phone right now, pretending to pay attention to it? <laughs> okay, good. Um, Well, whenever I talk about the, the, the near-term future of, of media, I always think how much, I've got two dials, I've got the hope <coughs> dial and the panic dial, and I can put them up and down <laughs> in various ways. Uh, but I wanted to, to frame today around what I think is a fundamental truth about what's happened to the media world in the United States and, and elsewhere. And this, is, this has always been true. A city, a state, or a country needs a civically-minded, institutionally-forceful media to thrive. That's the role that journalists play. I was a newspaper reporter for, for 10 years uh, doing investigative work, and we, we, we play a, a significant role in, in how a good uh, governance, a uh, well governed country governs. And today there are many economic and disruptive forces that are arrayed against that truth, um, which has uh, been a real challenge. So the framework I'm going to present here, I noticed on the, on the invite it said 2023, but there are 2022, five years from now. What will the media look like? In, in that period of time. And as you may notice, we have Prozac on the screen if any of you need, if it gets too depressing. <laughs> so these are the big questions that I'm going to be talking about today. How much in 2022 will be left in print? Will only a few technology companies control everything? 
Will digital advertising still support news? What will come after the mobile phone? What will be left in local news? Will broadcast be as disrupted as print was? And will we survive Donald Trump and fake news? <laughs> now, since I'm in Mexico, I assume this is a very pro-Trump room. So <laughs> apologies if, uh, if I offend. Um, all right, let's just go through those. And I have uh, about 180 slides, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. So uh, hopefully we'll have plenty of time left for questions. So in 2022, how much will be left in print? One thing that is very easy to forget is that newspapers and television stations to a different degree, or it's an industrial business. It's about buying trees from Canada, <laughs> putting them into very thin slices, putting ink by the barrel on them, running them through giant presses, putting them in trucks, gassing them up, delivering them places. It's an industrial business. And as you can see here, this is before the web how an average American newspaper spent its money. And fully half these three slices were production, distribution, and raw materials, right? So it's also interesting, uh, editorial, the newsroom is only 14%. Um, this is, that's been a number that's been consistent in the United States for a very long time. Around 12 to 15% of the money actually goes to paying journalists, which uh, as journalists can tell you, that, that makes sense given their size of their paycheck. So there were some publishers who when the internet came along said, hey, we're spending all this money on distribution the internet provides free distribution, maybe this is gonna work out for us. We'll get rid of half of our costs and uh, we'll still maintain our, our strengths. Everyone will still wanna read us every day. Uh, they thought maybe this, they could make a lot of money doing that. Well, this is what happened. This, this is, uh, they were wrong, those, those optimists. This is uh, American print uh, news, aver newspaper advertising revenue adjusted for inflation. You can see pretty steady uh, step up, you see big waves like the dot-com boom and, and, and other things around here. Any idea why there'd be more, why this is so wavy? The newspaper business uh, has always been more cyclical than others. When it's good times, things are really good at newspapers because advertising budgets increase. And when it's bad times, those get cut, so. So a peak around $67 billion, uh, around, around 2000. You know, the dot-com bust and then another leveling off. And then a roller coaster, a giant <laughs> rapid decline. Now part of this is the financial crisis, which happened right around, the, right around here. But uh, it continued on. During the financial crisis, print advertising was dropping around <coughs> 25 to 30% per year. Um, it mellowed out a little bit, so the decline dropped to maybe six to 8% per year. Um, but it's, it's increasing right now. The, the, the decline is re-accelerating. You'll notice this red line, which is print plus digital advertising you notice it's not that different from the blue line. Uh, what happened, uh, those newspapers, publishers who were optimistic didn't quite understand that they had a functional monopoly that gave them incredible pricing power for advertising. And as soon as that went away, their competitors on the digital side were just overwhelming them. So this is the most recent data from some major newspaper companies in the United States, uh, down you know, 10 to 17%. The UK, uh, Trendy Mirror, large chain, 27%. In Canada, Post Media is down 19%. So this is, this is the kind of decline we're seeing. Um, basically, newspapers have shrunk a lot. They have declined a lot, but they have a lot more room to go. Back in 2009, uh, Michael Wolf, a uh, noted commentator, commentator on media issues in the US, predicted about 18 months from now, 80% of newspapers will be gone. Well, like many things Michael Wolf says, that turned out not to be true. <laughs> uh, we did not see massive closures of newspapers. What we instead saw was massive shrinkage of existing newspapers. From 2007 to 2015, from 55,000 to 32,000 newsroom employees. Um, and this number isn't updated to 2016 because the organization that put this together got really sad and just decided we're not gonna put up a number anymore. <laughs> So why was newspaper, why were newspapers such a good business for so long? Because it's really good to be a monopoly. This is particularly true in the United States, less so in Europe and, and Latin America, but we ended up, with, uh, because we had a, a very large country geographically, with local monopolies in just about every city. And those folks had a monopoly on readers' attention because they didn't have another newspaper to compete with, and they had a monopoly on, on advertising relationships, and that was a good business. But we're starting to see a move beyond just shrinkage. This is the Contra Costa Times of the Oakland Tribune in California. Uh, these used to be two large newspapers. So they have been merged into one. So Oakland is a large American city that no longer has its own newspaper. 
Uh, I'm from South Louisiana, uh, and the Gannett Company owns a series of five newspapers across the state, and they've sort of been merged into one big newspaper that has a slightly different, has a different title <laughs> in different parts of the country, of uh, the state. So they, they share one publisher, one president, even though they're stretched across a large geographic area. We are gonna see a lot more of this clustering. We're gonna start to see newspapers close, and we're gonna start to see newspapers close in all but name. Uh, the local newspapers and metro newspapers are worse off than the national newspapers, the New York Times is gonna be fine. Um, I also expect to see significant amounts of day cutting, meaning seven day newspapers becoming six day newspapers, becoming four day newspapers, becoming maybe we'll put out a paper on Sunday. <laughs> um, the, the economics of print are, are getting substantially worse and I don't see anything over the next five years that's gonna change that. If anything, I think it's going to accelerate. All right, will technology companies control everything? Everything. <laughs> so to the traditional publisher, to a newspaper publisher, to a tele television station owner, their audience was essentially an undifferentiated <laughs> mass of people, right? If you were watching television, unless you were a Nielsen household or someone who was being measured, uh, the local station didn't have any idea what you were watching. They didn't know if you only wanted to watch the sports uh, report and you didn't care about weather. They had no idea what your individual preferences were, how many people in your house were watching. They didn't know any of that. A newspaper had a general idea of where you lived because they had your address to deliver it, but that was about it. They didn't know if you threw out the stock pages immediately and just read the comics. They didn't know. Um, there was a great report in uh, now five years old uh, by the New York Times called the Innovation Report. If any of you are interested in this subject, I advise you to go find it. We have a good summary on Neiman Lab and the documents available online. It was, it's really great for a certain kind of business, a business that has had success in a pre-digital world but is struggling to adapt to a digital world. They had a, a team of people from their own newsroom and their business side analyze why the New York Times was having trouble innovating. It's a great report. And one of the things in there was this line, currently our capabilities for collecting reader data are limited. The information is dispersed haphazardly across the organization and rarely put to use for purposes other than marketing. So who has a lot of data about people? <laughs> this guy, famed Harvard dropout, Mark Zuckerberg. And uh, uh, our friends here at Google Mexico here. Uh, these two companies, which sort of get lumped together as the duopoly in the discussion of, of, of publishers, have an enormous amount of data about you. Uh, who you know, Facebook, who you know, where you live, what content you like. What you buy, where you shop, they actually are purchasing that information from real brick and mortar retailers. What ads you respond to, Google knows of course what you're searching for, who and what you email, what apps are on your phone, your Android phone, the locations you search in maps, what you chat about, uh, the videos you watch on YouTube, and they have that information across devices, across years. It's an incredible amount of data. Uh, now, no, not all of this data is used for targeting. Uh, Google, for example, this summer, and what I think was a great move, announced that they were no longer going to be using your, the contents of your Gmail account to target advertising to you. But nonetheless, it's a completely unparalleled set of information. And really, uh, while Google had a, a period some years ago where a lot of publishers were very frustrated with, with uh, some of its actions, Facebook is really the, the, the current bete noir of, uh, of the publishing industry. Uh, the average American spends 50 minutes every day using Facebook products. What do you do for 50 minutes a day other than sleep and eat? <laughs> There's not a lot. Um, go to work, hopefully. Um, and that's not including WhatsApp, which is not a huge factor in the United States, but certainly very prominent elsewhere. This is a map, this is from a company called Parsley, which is an analytics firm that, that works with major publishers to track where the traffic coming in to publishers' websites is coming from. And this is all external traffic to, you can, you can say Parsley customers, basically all major publishers are close to it. These two lines are Google Search and Facebook. They, they've been around 35 to 40% each for a very long time. And third place, Yahoo, 2%. Fourth place, Twitter, 2%. Um, so these two institutions, you know, well-meaning, have an enormous amount of power over how publishers do their work. This was uh, Facebook last year at their F8 conference, their annual developers conference. Put up this, Mark Zuckerberg put up the slides and sort of lay out their roadmap. And you know, it starts with Facebook proper, then it expands into some of the ancillary products that they, they purchased or developed, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook Messenger, Groups. And then over here, you start to get to things that 
you know, publishers kind of look at it and say, well, I don't think we're going to beat Facebook on that. Uh, you know, virtual reality, you know, the, the Oculus Rift, uh, social VR, augmented reality, vision, artificial intelligence, language, artificial intelligence, artificial reasoning. And then up here are things like drones and satellites. And the most troubling moment of this presentation for me was that Mark Zuckerberg never explained what the lasers are. <laughs> <laughs> And I have to say that's been a concern of mine <laughs> ever, ever since. This, is a bit of, this has been a sea change in how people get news. This is a line from a New York Times story from 2008. It was just a straight comment made halfway through the story, but one that has really stuck with people in this world to understand better how people are getting their news differently. It was a woman who was doing a focus group with a group of people, including a college student, and that college student said, if the news is that important, it will find me, right? News consumption before the internet was very ritualized. You had a newspaper at the same time every morning that you would read at your breakfast table, or you watched the same broadcast every night. It was a ritualized part of your day. But now news is something that sort of finds its way into the nooks and crannies of your day. When you have a few minutes, you're standing in line, uh, or whenever, you know, when a push notification buzzes on your phone to tell you that something's important. And that really shifts enormous amounts of power to social media. Across countries around the world, social media is rapidly growing as a, as a source of information in the U.S. and elsewhere. This did not have data for Mexico, but I'm pretty sure it's the same story. Just in, uh, as I, uh, television news has always been the number one source of news for Americans, has been for decades. But just in one year, this is 2016, this is 2017, you can see how much television decline and online increased from a 19 point gap to a seven point gap. And a lot of that gain is happening among older folks, non-white folks, and uh, less educated Americans. Uh, this, this number stood out uh, about a year and a half ago when this was in the story in the New York Times. In the first quarter of 2016, 85 cents of every new dollar spent in online advertising went to one of two companies, Google or Facebook. Uh, this is the most recent data. Part of being a speaker is you get to take screenshots of your own tweets. <laughs> <laughs> but the most recent data from eMarketer, which came out about two weeks ago, uh, said that uh, if you add together Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, and Snapchat, they are actually getting 102.6% of all the growth which means that everyone who is not one of those five companies' digital advertising revenue is actually declining, mm -hmm. despite the fact that we're all glued to our phones all day. So one way that, that these companies and publishers have tried to adapt to this has been the, the, what, we, what some people call the distributed content revolution. So Facebook, uh, some years ago, uh, well, in 2015, said that uh, you have a nice website, that's great, publisher, uh, it's probably a little slow, your ads are probably terrible, um, you're not really able to sell them very well. Uh, why don't you publish inside Facebook into Facebook instant articles? They'll load very quickly, they'll be attractive, and we'll sell the ads for you if you'd like, and we'll keep 30% of, of the revenue. Um, and a lot of publishers have gone in completely on this. Uh, the, the Washington Post publishes everything that it publishes into instant articles. Others have tried it out and pulled back. The New York Times and The Guardian, for example, no longer do much in instant articles. Uh, Google has its own version, AMP, which is different in a lot of ways, uh, in that it is, it is more of an open source project that's dedicated to the web as opposed to uh, keeping you inside the Facebook app, but has a somewhat analogous set of restrictions and, and uh, efforts to speed up the web. <laughs> Snapchat has Discover. Uh, we're it's not, this is going one step further. It's not just saying publish your stories inside Facebook. It's saying create entirely original content that you will not be able to use anywhere else just for us. And Apple News has been a big, uh, surprising success story. I don't know how many of you use it if you're an iPhone or an iPad user, but um, again, this is publishing inside the Apple ecosystem. One way to sort of sum up the way that this, this has changed in a very short time, this is a website called The Verge. It's a technology website owned by Vox Media. So this is how people saw Verge content in 2015 versus 2016. So the big blue bar over here is website page views. You know, what you think of, you go to theverge.com and you read an article. You see that's actually shrinking a little bit from year to year. But you have this explosion in uh, Verge content being consumed someplace else, whether that's in Flipboard, or in Google Newsstand, or Apple News, or on YouTube, or on Facebook video, 
or Instagram or podcast listens. Uh, this is the, the reality of, of the demands and the, uh, in some cases, whims of these technology companies. So the Facebook wanted to really focus on live video, so they paid millions of dollars to news organizations in the US and, and elsewhere to uh, uh, have, require them to make a certain number of Facebook Live videos every day. Uh, here's a New York Times reporter pitching the story. They decided to film a pitch meeting where a reporter talks to his editor, which is normally something where, where you say something like, well, we don't have this confirmed, but let me say, which didn't work out as well. Now Facebook has decided it wants to invest in long-term, long-form video. The watch tab that, I don't know if it's a, launched in Mexico yet, but the new uh, watch tab that is in the Facebook app. They're again paying up to a billion dollars to ask publishers to create this content just for Facebook, or at least primarily for Facebook. Um, again, these technology companies have an enormous amount of sway over the kind of content that, that gets produced. And that's not even talking about the, the real issues that can come up when uh, a company like Facebook is sort of a common point of failure for all news on the internet. This was an incident of a year or so ago in which uh, Aftenposten, the largest newspaper in Norway, uh, published on its Facebook feed this famous photo from the Vietnam War of the girl fleeing being napalmed. Uh, Facebook decided that that was child pornography and kicked the newspaper off of Facebook. Uh, the, the, the Norwegian Prime Minister had to become involved to, to uh, address these issues. When, when all of our information is flowing through a company like Facebook, what, whether they're well-intended or not, it gives them an enormous amount of power, and sometimes they're gonna use it well, and sometimes they're not. So takeaways from this, increasingly having a direct path to your consumer is key. Um, it, there's an enormous flow of information that goes through algorithmically driven tech company platforms, and that can be powerful in terms of reach, but it means that in a lot of cases, your customers, your readers' connection is to the app that they're using, not to you, the publisher. Um, uh, and one thing that's also different is how we think about these, these technology companies. The duopoly of Facebook and Google is sort of the way that it gets framed uh, for publishers. GAFA, adding in Amazon and Apple, is the, how the French like to, to think of it. Um, we're now seeing additional large tech companies be interested in having a big role here. Amazon is suddenly really interested in advertising revenue, for example. So it's going to be a, continue to be a challenge for publishers. Number three, will digital advertising still support news? Maybe you could argue about the word still, that kind of implies it supports news now, which is debatable. So again, here's that same chart again. Uh, again, hello to our, our host at Google. Uh, this is Google's revenue uh, over that same period of time, and here's Facebook. Um, and credit to them, they built advertising products that are way better than what publishers can provide. This was a, a slide at a talk the last year that kind of stood out to me. Uh, the CEO of IDG, a publishing house, saying, how is the media landscape changing, and does digital advertising even work? Is it something that we can count on? So if you are a publisher, and you know that Facebook and Google have far better user data, you're not gonna compete with them on that. What can you, as an individual company, decide to invest in where you might have a competitive edge? And the answer for just about every premium publisher in the United States and Europe has been native advertising, sponsored content. Publish things that look a little bit or a lot like articles, but are actually produced either by or for advertisers. This is David Ogilvy, the famous ad man from the 1960s. Uh, think Mad Men, he was basically Don Traper. Kind of <laughs> uh, we don't know if he had a false identity, I don't know about that. <laughs> This is a line from 1963, there is no need for advertisements to look like advertisements. If you make them look like editorial pages, you will attract about 50% more readers. You might think the public would resent this trick, but there's no evidence to suggest that they do. Uh, so this is the New York Times. Now, you are all savvy news consumers, I'm sure. Uh, if you saw this, would you think that this was a news story or an ad? Right, because you're savvy, you know. Also, <laughs> I've given you clues here. But, so here you see the word paid post right here, a tiny little Chevron logo. If you looked at the URL for this webpage, it would be paidpost.nytimes.com, not www.times.com. You see T Brand Studio, 
which is the, the rubric under which the Times puts it, its content marketing, but it's not something I think most people would understand. You'd notice the typography is different, right? That's not a New York Times headline font or, or, or body font. Um, so maybe you would get this. Uh, you would all get it because you're brilliant, but maybe <laughs> other people would get it as well. So this is Forge. This is another piece of sponsored content. It's a little bit hairier, right? Um, because the headline looks exactly like a Forbes headline. The body copy looks exactly like the body copy. Maybe you understand what brand voice connecting marketers to the Forbes audience means, maybe, but I don't think the average reader might. Uh, it's listed under a ca you know, regular category of the site. And you do have a, a Citibank logo here and there, um, but I think a lot of people would just see this and think it's a story. And of course, BuzzFeed, whose entire business, is, or at least a very, very large portion of it, is built around uh, sponsored content and native advertising. This looks just like a BuzzFeed story, except it's a brand publisher. Big Miracle Grow is out to, <laughs> to, to tell you about gardening tips. So those three that I just showed you from the New York Times, Forbes, and BuzzFeed were actually part of an experiment that was done testing the degree to which readers can tell the difference. Um, so they weren't in the context where we're talking about the end of advertising, but they showed people real stories and sponsored content and said, what do you think that is? And on nearly every publication we tested, consumers tend to identify native advertising as an article, not an advertisement. Now, why would a publisher do this? The New York Times has an incredible brand that's developed over you know, more than a century. Why would it risk confusing its readers or either intentionally confusing its readers or unintentionally confusing its readers? Because, with, because they know, publishers know that they can't win on data, they are look really essentially taking their brand equity and seeing how they can use it. Um, I tend to think this hasn't harmed them that much, and there's a lot of money in it right now. Um, as David Ogilvy said, you'd think this might offend the audience, but it doesn't seem to. Um, but this is really a place that there's a lot of investment. Even though there's you know, studies, as you might expect, the less clear the disclosure is, the more effective the ad is. And then on top of that, you have ad blocking. I have, I have to come up with an image that means ad blocking, so blank billboards, that's what you get. Um, ad blocking is on the rise, as this dramatic chart can tell you. Now I should note, this is a chart produced by a company called PageFair that sells anti-ad blocking solutions to publishers, so they have a slight interest in <laughs> emphasizing how bad ad blocking is. And I will also note that an uh, enormous amount of this growth is happening in China, because it's very common for popular web browsers to come with ad blocking turned on automatically. But it nonetheless is, is a real thing. It's very different across countries. Uh, in Europe, it's, it's worse than in the United States, around 16% or so to the extent we have good data of Americans use an ad blocker. But in Poland, 35%, in Germany, 25%. You see, do see a lot of variation. Um, and publishers, I don't know, have you started to see new sites where you want to see something and you've got an ad blocker on and says, hey, if we see you have an ad blocker on, you're mean, don't do that to us. <laughs> In general, though, ad blocking has not been as bad of a problem for publishers as a lot of them feared um, a, a year or two ago, which may just be because digital advertising isn't a very good business to begin with. Um, so in that context, you know, the average American newspaper traditionally got 80% of its revenue from advertising and 20% from readers, from subscribers, from people buying it at the newsstand. Uh, in Europe and much of Latin America, that was always more like 50-50, but it was, the US was very advertising dependent. So the New York Times in its most recent sort of self-analysis uh, declared that we are in the simplest terms a subscription first business. We're gonna make money off of people liking what we do and paying us for it. And if we get advertising revenue in addition, great, we love that. But uh, they, have, they have, I think, very smartly oriented themselves around a much more sustainable business model. And we have seen uh, a slight increase globally, but a significant one in the United States about people being willing to pay for online news. Thank you, President Trump. Um, so in that context, remember I said in the last, in the last section, it's really important to have a direct-to-consumer connection. What is something that can provide that connection? Well, email newsletters. Email newsletters. Who would think that email newsletters are like a booming area of media investment in 2017? But an email newsletter is a direct connection between a publisher and the audience. 
you're inviting, say, interrupt my inbox every single day or every week. And similarly, podcasts, another old technology in web terms, but one that is really growing and, and having a, a remarkable period of uh, expansion. Again, because you're saying, I'm, I'm subscribing to you. I'm give, giving you permission to deliver me content. And there's, there's some good businesses being built out of podcasting right now. So takeaways, uh, relying on ad network money is not gonna be enough. Uh, we haven't figured out yet what the most what the appropriate engaging mobile ad experience is going to be. Um, we've sort of gotten beyond tiny banners being replicated from desktop to, to mobile, at least some of us have. Um, but nonetheless, we haven't figured out what the right way to create value for brands that doesn't annoy users looks like. So speaking of mobile phones, what comes after mobile phones? You've probably all seen this slide because it, it's, I think it's obligatory to include it in any slide deck. But this is, this is when Pope Benedict was chosen in 2005. This is the same place uh, in 2013 when Pope Francis was chosen. Can you see any differences between the scene? <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, I think, really actually kind of easy to underestimate how completely transformative these devices have been and how we get and, uh, and, and consume news. Just about every major publisher has, has passed the majority mobile threshold, being they're seeing the majority of their audience is on phones as opposed to desktop computers or laptop computers or tablets. But in, a lot, in most cases, or at least in a lot of cases, they're still getting less than 10% of their digital revenue coming from mobile devices, um, which is not an encouraging stat. So I wanna show you uh, a series of slides here that uh, will show you how the money is being shifted in the advertising world among various media platforms. So this is from 2010. This is from um, uh, Mary Meeker's famous slide deck that she presents at, uh, uh, every, every year. She works in an analyst at Connor Perkins. There are five types of media here, print, radio, TV, internet, and mobile. So internet is desktop internet and laptop internet. And for each one, there are two bars. The red bar here, the left, is how much of our time as Americans, this is US data, of our media consumption time, how much of it is in that medium. So of all the time Americans spent consuming media in 2010, 43% of that was spent watching TV. 8% was spent looking at our phones, right? So if you look at this, you see two real anomalies. One over here is mobile, which was attracting 8% of our attention, but only 0.5% of ad dollars. The other one over here is print, which was getting 27% of ad dollars, but only 8% of our attention. Now there's no iron law that those two would equalize over time, but it's kind of what you would expect, right? If, if users' attention is no longer somewhere, you would expect advertisers to be spending as much money on it. So this is 2010. I'm gonna show you 2011 through 2016, and I want you to look at those two, print and mobile, because there's not a ton going on the other three. So there's 2010, here's 2011. See, mobile has doubled from 0.5 to 1%, up to 8 to 10. Print has dropped from 8 to 7%. Here's 2012. See those, that same trend continuing. 2013. So the, the mobile internet is already almost catching up to the desktop internet. Print is continuing to shrink, but you'll notice there's still a big gap here. This is 2014. 2015 in 2016. So mobile went from half of 1% to 21% of ad dollars. The money has shifted. A lot of it has shifted from desktop internet as well. As you can see, there's more money now in mobile than desktop. And we are already focusing a lot more attention on our phones. Print, remember, was at 25% at the start of this. They've shrunk down to 12. But again, there's a huge gap here. When I say print has a lot farther to fall, that's what I mean. Um, you'll also notice TV has shrunk. Um, it, to the extent that uh, all that time spending on our phones, a lot of it has come out of what was previously TV watching time. <coughs> what happened when we moved from the desktop and laptop internet to the mobile yeah. internet was, was more transformative than some people expected. A lot of people thought that the phone was just a smaller laptop screen. It's just a screen, it's smaller. We'll have to make it as a little smaller. It'll all work out. But on the web, on your laptop, when you're going to a website, every website is sort of on the same level. They're all a URL that you type into your web browser. 
They're all available via a link. They all have, they're all sort of equal citizens. But when you shift to the phone, you're trading the open web for a closed ecosystem of apps. I mean, when, when the iPhone was first introduced, Steve Jobs showed off the fact that you could see the New York Times homepage on there. Um, who would want to read this on a phone? That was the end of this day, but. Um, so today, smartphone users spend about six minutes inside of apps and for every one they spend inside Safari or Chrome or whatever their web browser is. And that has meant there's an enormous amount of power that's accrued to the people who have the most popular apps. And these are, in the US, the most popular apps. And you'll notice that all but two of them are controlled by two companies, Google and Facebook. Again, I love you, Google. You're wonderful. Thanks for, for the podium. Um, and again, brilliant work on their part. Congratulations. Um, but it does mean, again, you're, people are not having a direct connection with a uh, media brand the same way that they would have before. I will say, I love that you're all taking pictures, but if anyone wants to email me, I'll send you these slides. Don't worry about it. Um, so the, we used to say we were moved from print dollars to digital dimes in terms of advertising, and now we're kind of going to mobile pennies. Um, I don't know what, we have to think of something smaller than pennies to continue this metaphor going forward. Um, so there's a lot of debate uh, in the world. I mean, smartphones have kind of gotten boring. Like, you know, there's a new iPhone this year, it's great, it's fancy, but it's not radically different from last year. It doesn't open up radically transformative new uses. I mean, remember the early years of the iPhone, like it went from being terrible to being like, oh, usable. Uh, in the growth curve of smartphones, we're sort of at the point where uh, things have leveled off. It's not as interesting a space. So there's a lot of thought, what's gonna be the next big platform to come along? So here's some of the nominees people think about. 23% of, of people surveyed across all countries in the world use messaging apps for news weekly. So maybe it's WhatsApp, maybe it's Facebook Messenger. We gotta get into that chat platform where people are spending a lot of time talking to their friends. Maybe they wanna talk with their local daily news brand as well. I don't know if I believe that, but. Um, so this past year, we saw a lot of major news companies build Facebook Messenger bots that will have awkward stilted conversations with you while telling you the news. Um, these have all been failures. None of these have been <laughs> successes. In part, I think, because people really don't want to mix up their time chatting with their friends and their family. It's, it's kind of a weird merger of spaces. But nonetheless, it's an area that a lot of folks are interested in. The one, if you, if you haven't seen it, uh, this is a company called Quartz, which is a very innovative company uh, based out of New York. They cover global business. Their iPhone app is entirely in a chat interface. And uh, it's actually pretty compelling. Uh, I invite you to go download it, the Quartz iPhone app. I don't think they're on Android yet. Maybe they are. Um, but it's a taste of what this sort of future could look like. Then you have virtual reality. It's another nominee, uh, which I sometimes think is just a conspiracy to make us all like hold something up to our face <laughs> or doing something else they should. But uh, this is at the New York Times when they first debuted their, their VR experience. Um, I, I've always been a little bit of a VR skeptic when it comes to news in particular. Um, a, because the current iteration of the technology is very clunky and requires connection to a big PC, and it's, it's not something that people want to immerse themselves in for long periods of time. But that's all gonna get better. I mean, technology improves. There will be a good user experience at some point. But I think that to the extent that it does happen, that it does become mainstream, it's gonna become mainstream through gaming and through movies and you know entertainment. Um, to the extent that news is in there, it'll be sort of a trailing factor. So um, there are a lot of companies that are investing a lot of money into VR right now, news companies, and I'm not sure that's the best use of their resources. Then you have devices like this, the Amazon Echo, the, the looming black cylinder that has somehow found its way into many people's homes. I'm sure uh, I don't know if any of you use, uh, have the Echo or are familiar with it, but it's this device that sits in your home and you can talk to it and ask it questions and tell it, ask it to play music and uh, do a variety of things that mean it's sort of a, it's a personal assistant that is voice activated in the home. Amazon is the leader in this space, but Google has the Google Home and Apple is coming out with the Apple HomePod uh, later this year. Now, this is a very interesting space. This has been growing uh, substantially and there's something that news companies like about being in the home. They would like you to, in the morning when you wake up and you're making breakfast, say, Alexa, what's the news today? 
And that become part of your ritual, the way that newspaper consumption or TV consumption was. Um, so you have a lot of news companies that are building audio experiences of some sort or another um, that uh, are doing interesting things. You also have, uh, there's now new technology that will let uh, news organizations send push notifications to the device. So you come home and there's a, the ring at the top is green instead of blue or some other color and you say, Alexa, what did I miss? And I'll say, well, there was a big story in, in uh, Spain this past weekend. Um, there's some promise here. Um, I, I tend to think this is gonna be an ancillary uh, part of how news gets figured out, in part because uh, I don't think people wanna talk to devices that much. I don't wanna talk, like, I don't know, I'm not a big Siri user, but I don't wanna like say, Siri, what's up, an end of an object. Um, but it's another area where people are invested. You have smartwatches, which some people thought would be really important. Um, hasn't turned out to be particularly for news. It's a great headline delivery device. It's great for sending push notifications to your wrist. So in that sense, it is good at driving attention to news. But the native Apple Watch and, uh, and Android Wear news experiences that have been built have all been pretty disappointing. Again, the technology will keep getting better, uh, but I think it's gonna be, again, on the side. I'll support that. But I think that there is a, a future that you can see a few years from now, that if we are five years from now, we might be a little bit closer to that, I think actually is gonna be pretty important for news. So Apple has these, these uh, AirPods, wireless earbuds that you, you put in your ear. Walking around uh, Boston and New York, places like that, I see a lot of people with them on. Um, I, I have them, they're really nice. My, my son, I love him dearly, but he lost one, so I'm <laughs> not <laughs> moral. Um, but when you think about if someone is in the Apple ecosystem, for example, they have an Apple Watch on their wrist, which can buzz them to notify them when something is important. And if we get to a point where wearing these wireless earbuds is something that people do a lot more often, I will say when I got my AirPods, I ended up having a, have them in my ears a lot more often than I did when there was a wire connecting it to a phone. You can start to see how that could be used out, you know, when there's important news, you get a little whisper, or when you're in a certain place, uh, messages are, are coming to you from that device. And everyone knows that Apple, as well as other companies, are working on another Glass product. Google Glass was, of course, the first uh, prominent iteration of this, and it still has uses in some industrial settings. But Apple is going to have some sort of pair of glasses that will hope will probably look good because they're Apple. They're good at making pretty things. Uh, Amazon is working on one of these. And that will be able to show you real-time information the way that Google Glass did in a more limited fashion. So I can sort of see this future where we have physical contact on our wrist. We have these tiny little earbuds that we use to listen to music most of the time, but can also be like your, your meeting is five minutes from now. You're, you're going to be late. Or the Spanish election just went a certain way. <laughs> and you've got the glasses on that can, uh, this feels like something that in five years, we're gonna be a lot closer to. Uh, it, it'll be closer to reality. It'll take, I think, a company that can build a set of products that has other uses. You know, Apple Watch is, is marketed as a health and fitness device more than a uh, buggy whenever something is happening device. Um, but this, this, catch all of what we would call augmented reality is something that I think we are closer to. And when I think about what's gonna come after looking at our phone all day, I think it's gonna be something like this. So yeah, we are in a weird waiting period in the growth curve of smartphones, they've gotten kind of boring. One issue is the, the dynamics of push and pull. One thing that your phone is really good at is sending you interruptions all the time, which is one of the good things about it, one of the bad things about it. Does that same system work when you're in a voice interface, for example? Probably not. And again, publishers are busy navigating platforms to save technology companies that they deal with in other ways. What will be left in local news? So as I said at the beginning, news is a distribution business. It's important to remember. Um, it was putting the papers in the trucks and delivering the places. It was building the broadcast tower. It was maintaining these technological uh, interfaces that allowed content to reach audiences. And when the internet came along and distribution was, was made functionally free, you ended up having a major shift in the kinds of news that it made for economic sense to create. When a truck delivering a newspaper could only go so far in the morning, 
look at how far the truck could drive and draw a circle. That's basically the area that the newspaper was interested in, journalistically. They covered City Hall in that place, they covered the county government, they, count, they covered the, the mayor, they covered the local sports teams. Uh, same with the broadcast tower. A broadcast tower could only go so far that incentivized those broadcasters to focus on local content. And in the United States, we had this extended period of time where we kind of lucked out. Our democracy is structured around local, you know, local elections and local structures, and our media ecosystem was structured similarly. But when you shift to digital, there's no reason to just focus on Providence, Rhode Island, or Morelia, or a, lo a specific location, because anyone can get your content anywhere. And while geography is an important way that we think about the information that we want or we need, it's not the only way. So all these companies that have uh, attracted a lot of venture capital are interested in, in growing substantially, BuzzFeed, Vox, Business Insider, uh, Vice, et cetera. These companies are all interested in a national or global audience. Because why wouldn't they? Why would you want to say, well, I'm, we're going to intentionally ignore 99% of our potential customers? They're instead interested in demographics or psychographics, not, not geography. They're interested in targeting Hispanic millennials between the ages of 18 and 29. They're interested in, in targeting uh, you know, uh, people who make over $100,000 a year and fly five times a quarter or whatever. They all have their idea of who their audience is, but it's not tied to geography. And that's been a really big blow to local news. The New York Times used to cover local issues in New York substantially, and they really scaled back on that. And they, very smartly, they're making the right choice financially, are investing in NYT on Espanol and, and other products that are aimed at reaching a global audience. I'm just curious, since I don't have the opportunity to ask this, uh, raise your hand if you actually, have you consumed Spanish language content from the New York Times? Remember me? Okay. Um, but what that has also done is meant that Digital in the United States, and this is true in other countries as well, has really removed the geographic diversity in journalism. Every city in America had a newspaper, had TV stations. I mean, that journalists were disproportionately spread around, around the country. Um, but now, these digital outfits, even though theoretically they're digital, they could be based anywhere, they're all based in Manhattan or DC. Um, it's a very centralized business. This was some data I, I ran last year. I looked at available jobs in television and, and newspapers and digital media. 8% of the jobs in TV were in New York or DC. 10% of the newspaper jobs were, but almost 40% of the digital jobs were in New York or DC. This has really significant impact. Um, people feel amount of, an amount of trust with their local news media if they know the reporters. They've been reading the newspaper for a long time. They realize that they are sort of involved in the same project of promoting their city and making it a better place. That's something that can create a connection and a trust. When you are, for example, a Donald Trump voter in, in some place, and your media is all being produced by, by very well-off people in Manhattan who went to Ivy League schools, um, there's a reason why you would anticipate a growing distrust there. Um, you would expect that this would make the, the media more culturally liberal, more interested in urban issues, and less connected to, say, the, the average Donald Trump voter. So there are a variety of organizations. There are a lot of digital news startups. They tend to be clustered in these two trade associations, if you're interested, Line Publishers, which is most of the smaller sites, the Institute for Nonprofit News, which is a lot of the investigative sites and things like that. But uh, they've been really unevenly distributed around the country. Again, the great thing about the newspaper model was you didn't have to have a brilliant publisher. You didn't have to have a brilliant editor. You needed to be the only newspaper in town, and that was a license to print money for a very long time. Online, you really do need remarkable talent in a lot of cases, and that talent is not evenly distributed. You have a lot of interesting digital news startups in well-off suburbs, in college towns, in places that already have a lot of cultural capital. It can work. But uh, again, the small town that I'm from in South Louisiana, you gotta go about 200 miles before you run into a digital news startup. Mm -hmm. These are some of the companies that, that I admire that are trying to build something different. Charlotte Agenda in North Carolina, Billy Penn in Philadelphia, The New Tropic in Miami. They're all trying to build local news, uh, expecting to start on a mobile platform. They're not stuck <laughs> trying to transition from a print or a, or a broadcast background into digital. They're starting fresh, they're making smart decisions, they're doing a lot around events 
around trying to make people, particularly younger people, more informed and engaged members, you know, citizens of their city. Um, they do interesting things. Um, if you're interested, I, I would suggest looking at them. And then there's Jeff Bezos, who I just think is looming in the background of all of this. Um, who would be interested in having a local distribution network in cities all around the country? Who has bought a large newspaper and um, is interested in, in the space in a way that we didn't quite anticipate? Who has, the New York Times, the Washington Post now has uh, subscription agreements with over 300 local newspapers around the country to say if you subscribe to the local newspaper, you also get a free subscription to the Washington Post. And they are building a back-end network uh, for the uh, content management system called ARC, which they then license out to newspapers around the country and actually in, also in Latin America. Uh, I just think there's something, we'll, we'll be hearing more from Jeff on that, I suspect. So anyway, takeaways here. If you are lucky, if you live in a place, if you live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as I do, uh, if you live in a New York City suburb in northern New Jersey, you're probably getting a more a, a broader and more diverse set of news sources than you did before. If you are not lucky and you live in a place that doesn't have that social capital, you might be getting no news at all. And local really hasn't been solvable in that scale. Um, there was a company called Patch which tried to invest in building out uh, a huge network of, of sites around the, the country. It didn't work out in their first iteration, uh, but nonetheless, I was just happy they were interested in local news. Venture capital doesn't seem to be very interested in local news. Cash still lives on in a, in a slightly different form. All right, broadcast. Okay, how many of you would say that you get uh, that you get more of your news from television than from any other source? Not many, but. In, of course, you're very sophisticated people. You're all <laughs> reading the Financial Times every morning. Sure. Um, let's talk about radio first. Uh, in the U.S., that means National Public Radio, NPR, for, for we're talking about news content in a large way. And they have seen, in some cases, significant drops in young people uh, listening to their, their content. And we've seen this remarkable growth in podcast companies, all of whom are trying to replace terrestrial radio in some way. Um, <coughs> There's even been a little boom in the last uh, last few months about daily news podcasts. The New York Times produces one called The Daily, which a lot of people really like. Uh, NPR now produces one of its own. Um, another, there's a, Box.com is in the process of, of creating one. The, again, the idea that you might have a morning ritual of listening to a 10 or 12 minute podcast that can keep you up to date on what's, what's going on. But it, the real one of the real disruptive shifts for radio and audio and podcasting is gonna be when driverless cars come around. What, what is the big area where radio wins against other media? It's when you're in your car and you can't, or at least you shouldn't be looking at your phone. Uh, you can't be watching a video or shouldn't be watching a video, to be clear. Um, so it's a very unique environment where Americans and Mexicans and other people spend a lot of time commuting into work and commuting back from work. When suddenly you're no have to you don't have to look at the road anymore, does that mean that radio and audio loses its special position and it becomes just another competitor to words and video? So let's talk about TV for, for a minute. So this is in the United States. This looks like a gentle sloping line, but it's actually terrifying for TV companies. For 18 to 24 year olds in 2010 to 2016, how many minutes of television do they watch every day? That's a drop from 250 to 150 in a, in a seven year period. Um, young people are, are, you know, when, I, when I'm talking to a college class and I ask like, how many of you actually watch a television show when it's being aired on television? And they just laugh and laugh and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you have folks like Apple and Roku and Amazon and others who, are, who believe some version of that, you know, this is a, uh, Tim Cook quote, what we believe the future of TV is in apps. That, that individual experiences will be pulled out of the bundle that you get with cable or satellite. Um, it's, this has a, raises a bunch of really interesting questions. You know, in, in the United States and other, other places, if you subscribe to cable, you're subscribing to 200 channels. You probably only ever watch three of them, but your money is still going to all of them. If you have a cable subscription in the United States, you're, you're paying about $6 a month to ESPN. It doesn't matter if you ever watch ESPN or watch it all the time, it's the same amount. And there have been a lot of great businesses built out of this bundled uh, 
cash flow model. When that gets unbundled, what happens to all those networks that aren't being watched? And in particular, what happens to local news? ABC, NBC, and CBS had to create local stations because that was how distribution happened before cable. You had to have a broadcast tower in every city. That meant that they had local news operations for all the reasons we've been discussing. If CBS, ABC, and NBC are just an app on your Apple TV, does local news fit in there at all? If all we're doing is watching Netflix and Amazon Prime Video, is there any space for, for news period, much less local news? Which again has those same scale questions. Does anyone know what this is? <laughs> These are two people dressed in bunny seats, suits with a watermelon. And they are wrapping rubber bands around the watermelon one by one. The idea being that they want to see how many rubber bands it takes to make the watermelon explode. <laughs> These are staffers at BuzzFeed. Uh, they decided on a Friday last year to start to show this live on Facebook Live. It was 45 minutes long. It turns out it's about 700 rubber bands, in case any of you are interested in trying this at home. Um, this got, I believe, 12 million viewers. This got higher ratings than anything on actual television during that same time slot. They're, I mean, BuzzFeed's very good at this. They did this on, on a Friday afternoon when like, everyone's sitting at their computer and already bored and not thinking about it. So this was sort of a wake-up call. like. This is the future, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's watermelons exploding. Um, this is a, a, an executive at Facebook who last year uh, said at a conference that she expected Facebook will be all video in five years. I would have more information, but it's just a screenshot of a video, so I can't really tell you much about it. Um, and there is, there is this sense in some, which some people believe video is going to eat everything else. And that is why. A lot of news organizations in the United States, I think short-sightedly, have said they are pivoting to video. The pivot to video involves firing all the people you, who, who know how to write <laughs> and deciding to invest all your money in making 90-second videos for Facebook. Um, and on one hand, they are chasing where the audience is. People do watch a lot of video on, on Facebook. But I really question the degree to which this is going to be a winning strategy for news organizations. There are plenty, I mean, maybe it's a winning strategy for BuzzFeed to show recipe videos, tasty videos, which are an enormous success on Facebook and they do very well. But this was analysis that looked at how people use news sites and they found that only 2.5% of all the time that readers spent on news sites that had video were spent on pages that had a video on them, even though those were 6.5% of all the pages. So having a video on a page made someone less likely to spend time on it. And even for esteemed news brands that do really excellent investigative reporting and foreign correspondence, the videos that people like are still animals. <laughs> they like cats. They like zoo animals doing funny things. <laughs> it is, I think, a real open question to the degree to which, I mean, people love video. I think it's an open question whether they love news video. Um, here, I'm taking a screenshot of an interview with me, which is another <laughs> privilege that you have when you're, when you're you know, the platform control of monetization, everyone's reliant on YouTube and Facebook to make money. The high cost structure of producing quality video, the terrible quality of much of what they're being producing, I really question the degree to which publishers are going to en masse uh, make money off this. And this is just data from, from this past week. So Facebook is now testing mid-roll advertising for, for publishers. Uh, so if you watch a Facebook video from a certain company after 20 seconds, there will be a very short ad and they can make money off of that. But there are five, this uh, Digiday, the news organization that, that wrote this, asked, asked five publishers if they were making any money off of it. This one said, we had 20 million video views and we made 500 bucks. Thank you. The average CPM cost per, per thousand impressions for this company was 15%, or 15 cents, excuse me. So you get someone to watch a video a thousand times, you get 15 cents. Uh, again, I have real questions about this strategy going forward. And as platforms giveth, like Facebook has given these really inflated numbers of big, you know, 10 million views, even though a view on Facebook is it's on your screen for three seconds, whether sound is playing or not. Uh, the platforms can give that, but they can also take it away. Apple in the new version of OS 10 that just came out, or Mac OS, I should say, uh, is automatically stopping autoplay videos on, on web pages, which I think is great but it's not so great if you built your entire business on having autoplay videos that create an artificial inflation in your view count. 
younger Americans are actually more likely than older Americans to prefer reading news rather than watching it. And that kind of makes sense. Older Americans grew up watching television all night, all day. Uh, younger people have grown up with these devices that, for whatever you think of them, have created an enormous amount of text going back and forth. Reading and writing is something that they are, they are very comfortable with for, for news consumption. So everyone is chasing that television money. There's still an enormous amount of money in television. Television has been very uh, resistant to disruption. As a former newspaper reporter, I always felt a little angry at my television colleagues that my business got screwed over way faster <laughs> than theirs did. Um, but, so the expectation is something Snapchat talks a lot about is that that television money is gonna go to digital somehow and they wanna be the best place for it to go, which is why everyone's investing in video. Um, but now you have these digital companies that are actually now running back to cable and saying, you know, like Vice, we want to invest in creating actual television shows. Vox Media is investing in building actual television shows because the money in cable television is at least pretty knowable. It's a, it's a known structure. And as I said, it's unclear how news, especially local news, will fit in this transition. And finally, <laughs> will we survive Trump? So a personal story, I'm from this small town of Rain, Louisiana, uh, in South Louisiana, about 6,000 people or so. Frog capital of the world, you're all welcome to come to the Frog Festival, enjoy the frog races, go, go see the frog pageant, it's a great event, family friends. Um, the mayor, so the, the mayor of my hometown of Rain, Louisiana, uh, has a Facebook page like every other human being on the planet. And in the 48 hours before the election last year, uh, the presidential election in the United States, uh, these were stories that he shared. Hillary Clinton is calling for civil war. Pope Francis shocks the world and endorses Donald Trump for president. Barack Obama admits he was born in Kenya. And <laughs> that Hillary basically killed an FBI agent. Mm -hmm. And these were just some. There were dozens and dozens of stories saying that Hillary Clinton was an actual demon. Not just a bad person, but a demon. Um, and, and that Barack Obama had murdered a whole set of people and was actually a, not just a Muslim, but a gay Muslim, and those are much less trustworthy. All these terrible uh, uh, stories that are all fake being distributed, and they had a really significant impact. So the Pope Francis story was shared almost a million times on Facebook. That's shared a million times, so the number of people who saw it is much larger than that. Fake news has become such a thing that there's actually now a fake news beer. It's in Canada, though, so you, you want, if you want a fake news beer, you'll have to go visit Toronto or something. Um, so we're still coming to grips with the degree to which the news conversation was hijacked in, in uh, this past election and will be <coughs> continuing to be going forward. This is a study from the University of Oxford looking at the presidential election in Michigan and also in Germany. So this is Michigan users using Twitter, people who use certain ha hashtags related to the election. This is how much professional news they got, and this is how much fake news they got. Pretty darn similar. This was, a, this was another study out of uh, Stanford, I believe, that looked at uh, fake news stories that found that there were, they identified 115, so this is by no means all of them, 115 pro-Trump fake news stories is a small portion of it. Those were shared on Facebook a total of 30 million times far more than the pro-Clinton stories that they can find. Just for this limited set of fake news stories, 38 million shares of fake news translates into 760 million instances of a user clicking through and reading a fake news story. That's three stories per American adult. The average adult saw, and remember, they estimate about 1.14 fake news stories. Now again, that's the average. There are lots of people for whom that number was zero, but there are lots of people for whom that number was 30, right? There's been a long-standing debate, or to the extent that any debates on the internet are long-standing, you know, 10 years, uh, about what some people call the filter bubble. The idea of the filter bubble is, the wonderful thing about the internet is that we get to curate our experience, we get to follow who we want to follow, we, our friendships we get, get uh, transferred into digital forms and influence the way that we get information. And on one hand, that's great. Uh, if I didn't have access to that, I, I wouldn't be able to get as much news about the New Orleans Saints because I follow the right people about the New Orleans Saints, my team, uh, and that's wonderful. That's not a bad thing that, that's curated for me. I want it to be. 
But the idea was that your friends are, if you're conservative, your friends are conservative, if you're liberal, your friends are liberal. And to the extent that Facebook, for example, is showing you information that your friends have shared, you might be in this sort of feedback loop where you only get information you agree with. I was always a little bit of a skeptic of this, I confess, in part because there is a, there was some research that shows that, for example, on Facebook, the people you are friends with on Facebook is actually a more ideologically diverse groups of people, group of people than the people with whom you actually spend time in real life. For example, I live, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, it would, I'd have to hunt really hard to fund a Trump voter in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, but my friends all on Facebook also include people I went to high school with, the people I went to middle school with, and family back in Louisiana, and it's a much more diverse group than the people I actually interact with. So I, I, I was a little skeptical of, of this argument. But I really think what fake news did is convert weak 70s marijuana into pure grade heroin. <laughs> because suddenly, the, the, the potential endpoint of this filter bubble isn't a conservative sees more stories from conservative outlets and a liberal sees more stories from liberal outlets. The conservative gets more Fox News and the liberal gets more MSNBC. Instead, it could be that a person doesn't just get slanted news, slanted within the sort of normal realm of slanted news. It gets completely imaginary things. I, in talking to some of my friends and relatives back home in Louisiana, like, they really believed that Hillary Clinton was murdering people all through, during the campaign. It was weird because she was both dying and killing people at the same time. <laughs> really <worried. laughs> so why, why did fake news happen? Well, a big part of it, some people create fake news because they want to get a certain candidate elected, they want a certain policy outcome, but a lot of it is driven by money. In the old days, if you wanted to create a fake, fake news story in a newspaper, you had to get a printing press. You had to make sure that the typography matched up nicely. You had to distribute it everywhere. It was a hassle. Um, online, all you have to do is get a WordPress theme that looks kind of newsy. Come up with, you know, buy a domain name like the Denver Guardian or something that sounds newsy. And put your stuff up. And get it uh, seeded by the right Facebook pages. And watch it go. And in that environment, if you think back to the old way, when a newspaper had both the reader relationship and the advertiser relationship, there was sort of a, an enforcement mechanism that meant that it could, things couldn't get too crazy. If you start publishing crazy fake news, advertisers are probably not gonna wanna have their ad right next to your content. So that, that sort of confined that how far you could go. Online, getting advertising revenue is just putting, putting a few lines of code to a print ad network, and the incentive is then to be as extreme and crazy and shareable as you possibly can. To Google's credit, they have they have a policy now of not allowing their ad network to, to be on fake news sites. Um, Facebook has taken a, a similar step. But there are still plenty of other ad networks out there that are happy to do it. So in this past election, you, you may have heard that Macedonia was a particular place where fake news was created for, for the Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, this one town of Vellis, this one village, where apparently the major local industry is, is saying terrible things about Hillary Clinton. <laughs> And uh, uh, good reporters like uh, Craig Silverman have gone there and interviewed people, and they, they basically said, we didn't care who won the election. We just saw that the reaction, it was a lot easier to get the story rolling if it was anti-Hillary than if it was anti-Trump. So we won't where the money is. Just a few weeks ago, I, I saw this on, and I think it, I don't think this is fake. I think this is very much real. This is a freelancer site saying that they're looking for a writer for a Republican-oriented political website based in Macedonia. Um, <laughs> Previous experience with sensational titles preferred. <laughs> I think you're interested 500 euros a month, you know, uh, doing your spare time. Uh, only well, seven hours a day, every day of the week. And that's, that's a lot of time commitment. Um, preferred that you have perfect English. Um, so, on the, and make it so liberals will want to share it as well. So, a lot of these, these companies, these, to the extent they're companies, these operations, are producing conservative and liberal facing fake news at the same time, often just tweaking the headline a little bit. Um, and then of course beyond that you have folks who want to make a political impact, um, including, you may have heard of the Russians. Uh, so this was during the French election, these were all uh, new, uh, fake news stories about uh, a secret bank account that Macron had in the Bahamas, and they were all being driven, the, the accounts that were doing that were were based in, in Russia. You, you have, 
this fake news has really confused people an enormous amount. In part because fake news until roughly November 9th meant news that was fake. And then our president decided that fake news was news that he doesn't like, um, which hasn't really incentivized uh, a healthy discussion of these issues. So this is data from Pew saying that as of uh, last December, 64% of Americans said that completely made up news has caused a great deal of confusion about basic facts. Uh, the pub companies have gotten smart. They will sometimes use uh, Facebook like uh, accounts like BuzzFeed, not BuzzFeed, <laughs> BuzzFeed, again to try and look as normal as possible in, in the environment. And one, one unfortunate thing is that there really isn't a market now for creating a political news source that isn't ideologically committed one way or the other. Um, in the Bush years, uh, liberal sites grew quite a bit. In the Obama years, conservative sites grew quite a bit. But there really isn't a lot of room for the middle. Now, why is this? If you look at uh, Facebook data, you know how when you don't go beyond the, the thumbs up for like, you get the various options of emoji. So across Facebook, the number one reaction, of be the most popular beyond the thumbs up, is the heart, is love. Isn't that a beautiful thing that, that <laughs> it says about us? One exception, though, is political news, for which the angry emoji <laughs> is the most common. People get a kick out of being angered about the other side. And this is, this is, this is a uniquely American problem, but it's a problem that exists in other ways elsewhere, but I, for whatever reason, our political culture has, has made this insane. Um, the real issue isn't that people love their side. If they're Republicans, they don't love the Republicans, the Democrats, they don't love the Democrats. What has really happened is that they hate the other side, and the passion with which they hate the other side is ever increasing. So this is data from 1972 to 2012 asking two questions. How far do you think your point of view is from your party's point of view? That's this line, you can see it's pretty steady. And then how far away is the other party? And as you can see, it is going up and up and up. This is in the political science literature, it's called negative partisanship. Right? You don't like your guys as much as you hate the other guys. This is my favorite and most terrifying uh, chart of all time. This is asking people, Americans, if you are a Democrat, would you be really upset if your daughter married a Republican? And if you're a Republican, would you be really upset if your daughter married a Democrat? In 1960, <laughs> like three to five percent were like, yeah, I'd be really upset. Now, you can see, people are very upset at the idea of, of crossing that boundary. So platforms have tried a variety of things to uh, deal with fake news. Uh, Facebook has, has started flagging a certain amount of stories. If there are two independent fact-checking outfits that declare that a story is, is not accurate, they will flag it with a disputed tag. But there's actually new research just out a few weeks ago saying that while this has the right effect and people who see the disputed tag don't trust the story as much as people who don't, it has a weird blowback effect in that the fact that some stories are flagged as disputed means that the fake stories that aren't flagged, they believe them more because they aren't flagged. And Facebook uh, has a relatively limited capacity to flag these stories. They're relying on these outside companies that have few people and they can't generate enough fact checks. You know, admit, uh, governments are getting involved. Germany is thinking about fines of $53 million, 50 million euros for posting fake news if you don't get it down immediately, uh, which would be a very different incentive than what Facebook currently faces. But in the end, decades of research shows that most of us really prefer stuff that feels true to our worldview. So that has meant that now, as of March data, 27% of Americans think traditional major news sources like TV and newspapers report fake news stories regularly. 36% say they do so occasionally. When th there are surveys all the time asking, do you, do you have trust in the media? Part of the problem is that the media used to be a defined thing. But the media now involves stuff you see on Facebook and random uh, news organizations that are run by not well-intentioned people. This is other data asking people, uh, Facebook users, what percentage of the news that appears in your Facebook news feed do you believe to be fake news? And the average answer was 48%. <coughs> Now, fake news isn't this bad, but people have become convinced that, that it is this bad. You ask people why they avoid news, uh, 
liberals say they avoid news because it can have a negative effect on their mood, which in 2017 America is true. Um, but conservatives say they, they avoid it because they can't rely on the news to be true. See, really different uh, trust in the news by political allegiance. In the UK, conservatives trust the news more than liberals. In the US, it's the complete opposite. And we have this system in the United States. This is what the average audience belief of these various news sites is. You can see it's relatively balanced in the UK and in Germany. But in the US, other than Fox News, every other major news source is more consumed by liberals than by conservatives. There's a real sense in which our country just isn't having a shared conversation about anything anymore. Let's see if that. Um, here's overall trust in news media. We're down here with Hungary. Mexico, congratulations, you're over here. 49% trust. You can decide whether that's, that's a good thing or, or not. <laughs> but what we've really, really seen is that trust in every institution is down. Uh, across whether it's organized religion, public schools, Congress, just about everything. This is data from the US on how much how many people trust media, and you can see over time it's just going down and down. And I think the main takeaway that I have from this is that there was a very utopian vision of the internet in its early days, the idea that you know there would no longer be a choke point at the newspaper editor's desk or that are getting something on TV for voices to be heard. There'd be this flowering of uh, small d democratic voices rising up, everyone would have their chance to say get, get heard. But what it really has done is created mistrust in just about every industry that it has touched. And this guy isn't helping much when he decides that everything that he doesn't like is is just fake news, fake news, fake news. Uh, CEO of the New York Times says, thank you, Mr. Trump, because we now have a million more digital subscribers than we did before you came along. Uh, so is there any hope? Remember the dial, the hope dial? Is there anything there? You know, because I, again, I really do believe that a city, a state, or a country needs a civically minded, institutionally forceful media in order to thrive. There are a variety of, of outlets that are doing interesting things. Um, you know, I mentioned Quartz earlier, which does some really interesting work around at native advertising as well as uh, interesting platform work. Um, Axios is a new startup this past year from some of the people who started Politico, which does really compelling things. You have high-end products like the Information and Politico Pro, which will charge, in some cases, $10,000 for a subscription, but are instead just reliant on, on readers as opposed to advertisers. Um, the Ringer is a, a site that is almost entirely funded by its podcasts. They have a network of podcasts that, that back the rest of the content. The Correspondent is a site in the Netherlands that's coming to the United States right now that has a really interesting membership model that's been very successful. You have nonprofits, you have email newsletters like The Skim, uh, folks like The Financial Times who've done a lot in, in uh, merchandise work and uh, using their very high-end audience. Uh, the Athletic is a sports site that is uh, going to be paywalled and has been very interesting. So there are there are folks who are doing interesting things. They don't tend to be local news, and the other problem is that they tend to be targeting sort of the same demographic, which is college educated, relatively well off people who want information. One way I like to think about this is if you think about an average city 30 years ago, and from you, let's put you, you put everyone in the city in rank order, from the most informed person in the city to the least informed person in the city, right? Now look at like say the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile. At that time, those people probably read the same newspaper, watched the same TV broadcast. Sure, the guy at the top had more information, but the gap between them was relatively narrow. The world that we've created now is uh, where if you did that same exercise today, the most informed are incredibly informed. If you spend the time, if you have a, a job that lets you sit in front of a computer all day, and you have a smartphone, and you decide to curate your Twitter feed, and subscribe to exactly the right email newsletters, and you have Google Alerts set up, it's very easy to be incredibly hyper-informed. And I suspect a lot of people in this room fit into that category. And that can make it very easy for us to not see what's happening with the other 85% of, of, of the world because those people are really happy to just see whatever shows up on Facebook. And that means that that algorithm uh, has an enormous amount of, of power. So if I was advising someone on starting a new company today, some of the things I would tell them, if you can do it, target a high value audience, especially with a high value product. There are people who are willing to pay good amounts of money for news. Um, focus on reader payment, as I said. 
digital advertising if you're if you're not a technology company is sort of a fool's game these days. Don't be on reliant on platforms if you can be. Use them use them where you, where it makes sense, but try to figure out a direct connection if you all can. And aim for the logged in, logged in user. This is a big thing that the New York Times is, is doing right now. If someone is logged into a site, then you can gather data that can create more personalization, better better recommendation engines. That data is really important and it's gonna be more important going forward. The things that are really hard to do now, thinking about mass media, however you want to find mass media, that's something that doesn't really translate well to digital. And being reliant on digital ads, um, at least traditional digital ads. I'm sure new formats and new, new platforms will come around, but it's a really tough business right now. So, my vision for 2022, uh, here's some more Prozac if you need that. <laughs> the end, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.
because they're they are the reason why distribution is really high about that, uh, high in this this area. And Facebook is the biggest player, but there there certainly are others. Hi, Joshua. Uh, my name is Sebastian Mogia. Thank you very much for the conference. We are the amazing. Uh, this is a very deep uh, subject. We could talk about that. I mean, no, I've got more no, an hour. I mean, yeah. days or weeks. But I have two questions. One, what is more philosophic? Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what is more philosophical, and the other is more technical, perhaps. The first one is well. This is not uh, from today. You know, the internet culture, someone says that it's like more a snack culture, and when you consume information, you consume it more like a snack, like as a full meal. I mean, we, we, we read the titles, we don't go deeper in the, in the news and the information. Hey, what do you think about that? Because I think that uh, in today's culture, this snack internet culture, Yes, we don't go deeper. I mean, the, the, the analysis, the, the going beyond the, the mere uh, title or the new, is not something right. usual. I mean, we, we consume shit. I mean, we consume uh, the, the Pamela Anderson wedding is the same, is at the same level than perhaps uh, the earthquake in Mexico. Right. Uh, this is my first question, and this is not something that is happening today. It's happening I mean, right. many years ago. And the other one is uh, about algorithms, about the artificial intelligence. As you know well, I think that internet uh, promotes the annoying, the, the exaggerating things. I'm going to tell you, illustrate it with, with an example. When you're in a highway, there's a car crash, everybody uh, stopped to see the car crash. I don't like car crash, but we are attracted to them. I mean, we, 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 we stop. And you're stuck in traffic and everyone crash. in front of you stops. I think that the news happen the same. I mean, algorithms promote what you see, but doesn't mean, but it doesn't mean that I want to see car crashes. I right. don't want to see car crashes uh, in my feet. I, I think we've all had the experience at some point or another where some, some online platform over-optimizes for us. You search for two things somewhere, and then suddenly ads related to that are following you around the entire <laughs> internet. You're like, I didn't mean to search that that way, and now it's everywhere. Everyone knows I'm interested in X or whatever. Um, so on, on your first question, uh, the philosophical question, oh God, can you give me a one sentence on good question because I forgot to <laughs> turn your, your Yes, the moment, yeah, the snack code. Oh, right, okay, okay snack. I, I am, I, I want, one thing I always try to do whenever talking about digital things is to not over-romanticize the world we had before. It's not as if the average newspaper article was a great in-depth you know, treatise on, on an important issue. Newspaper stories had their own limitations. Um, and aside from that, we were blessed by not having any data about how people actually read newspapers. So we could put a 3,000 word story investigative report on the front page, and we would assume, well, everyone who got the paper read that. No, no, that didn't happen. Um, there's a reason why Softer sections, travel sections, entertainment sections, comics, crossword puzzles were really key to that model because there were a large number of people who just wanted to see the ads, who just wanted the entertainment piece of it. So I don't want to overestimate how it, the, the old world was not everyone reading the New York Review of Books and thinking deep thoughts and stroking their beards. Um, that said, I think what has, the way I look at the internet is that you can sort of think of a you. On one hand, the internet really likes short and quick. <laughs> It likes a tweet, it likes you know, a, a headline, it likes a very a news push notification, and it likes longer stuff. There are lots, there's lots of evidence that people, if they are really interested in something, will read very long stories on their phones. Um, what, they, what doesn't work is the stuff in the middle, the stuff that was sort of the classic TV news segment, the classic uh, newspaper story that is, has to face a, a broad audience, so they have to provide some background information, but not too much. You might be constrained by physical space constraints, uh, either time-wise or, or space-wise. And that doesn't really work so well. So I don't worry as much about snacking culture, because I think we've always sort of been there. And also, frankly, I don't think journalists can be pretty arrogant about how much their work, how much of someone's time their work deserves. Um, it's very, I, I run into people who say things like, well, there was just a, a coup in Gabon, and you don't know anything about it, and Americans don't know anything about it, and that's, that's terrible. Well, we are rational economic actors. We have other things to do than read about every country in the world. 
I think it's totally fine for people to be tactical and practical about how they consume news. I don't think we should be shaming people because they're not all, you know, reading thousand. They're not all reading Word and Peace every every week. And I'm sorry, your second question. What's that? It's about the uh, algorithms um, and yeah. uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, so over optimization is a, is a real issue. Um, there have been some experiments, and you can question with the, the methods, but where someone creates a Facebook account from scratch and then just starts liking everything that they, that Facebook says. And like within a week and a half, they're seeing Nazi propaganda. Because Facebook continues to read that behavior. It's like, oh, you really like this. You really like this. And it keeps getting more and more extreme. Um, now, that, that's an extreme case. But I can tell you, I'll be honest, I, uh, I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I have all my friends and my family in Louisiana. They're all conservative and, and mostly Trump voters. Their stuff doesn't show up on my Facebook feed. Because Facebook knows that I'm not going to engage with that in the same way. I saw zero fake news stories during the election. I didn't see any because my friends are journalists. They're, you know, they're not, their friends are academics. They're, they're not sharing that sort of thing. So that's another thing that makes it difficult for people to evaluate Facebook in particular. You have an image of what Facebook is like based on your use. So your use is radically different from your neighbor's use. From your, you know, simple questions like how much of your news feed is what we would call news? For some people, 80% of their news feed is news. For some people, 0% is news. So uh, the algorithms, algorithms are all tied down with the, human, the humans who create them. Their own biases go into them. There's a lot of interesting work being done around detecting bias and algorithms. Um, but on the other hand, when you get to the scale that digital media is, it's really hard to, to, to do something other than an algorithm. Because something, Facebook can't show you every post from all of your friends and all of your, every brand you like at the same time. They have to pick. Our attention is still the, 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 the constraint. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Hi. Um, hi. hi. My name is Jorge Tabuada. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I think it's, as a, as a media person, it was very inspirational and, uh, and as a light of hope. Uh, wow. I really get that response. So good. <laughs> I'm glad. Usually, yeah, it's like putting my wrists out the, back. The bad side of, of the of the response is that I, I see this as a mid-term scenario, more and probably in the case of Mexico, more as a long-term scenario. So, um, and so much of the stupid things that uh, media does are because uh, media needs money on the short term. So the media auto play is a great example. So, uh, how do you see this? Two worlds, you know, so the, the short term where media needs money and the long term, which can allow us to build the, 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 the right strategy in terms right. of our product and reaching the audiences. I'm, I'm a believer in general of the, the Clay Christensen philosophy of you know, the innovators. Uh, he finds that when there's a major technological disruption in an industry, it is almost impossible for the existing incumbents to change enough that they can adapt and still be leaders after this technological shift. There are tons of examples of this. Um, it, it is a lot easier if you're trying, if you're, if you're thinking, I want to create a digital news product, it is so much easier to start from zero and build that digital news product than it is to have an existing staff of 2,000 people and these giant printing presses and these reporters who are good reporters but are trained around producing stories once a day for the print edition that making that transition is so incredibly difficult. And uh, the one exception that he, that Christensen lays out uh, where an incumbent can pull this off is if they create essentially a subsidiary that is not governed by the same rules and the same constraints, and that subsidiary or a separate company is given permission to kill its parent. <laughs> and said you should compete with, with the larger company the same way you compete with everyone else. And that's why when I see, like local news, for example, local newspapers have done a terrible job adjusting. Local TV has done an even worse job adjusting to, to, to digital. But if you're starting from scratch, remember how I said the, the editorial product and the, the staff, the newsroom of the newspaper was like 12 to 15% of the total cost? If you're starting from that, you can actually create really interesting stuff with a very small staff and scale up from there. And that's, that's I think, is the kind of thing that's going to end up one day. You know, maybe they end up buying the rights to the name of the old newspaper to have a certain amount of ground to us, but I think in this environment, the traditional players are, are at a real disadvantage. Uh, 
Oscar Guillermo uh, from SIG, I guess. I have a question about the, the money paradox or the money issue. Uh, you talk about what uh, news media and news courts should do about uh, fake news. But what about uh, advertisers? Why they should put their money on real news when fake news gives them uh, revenue, gives them audience? Well, so one of the big issues that has been pushed in the last year, really a lot since the election, is brand safety, right? Uh, again, hello Google, but YouTube got into some trouble when a, a variety of brands <laughs> added or <laughs> of the jihad videos, and Google reacted as quickly as they can. But it's been an opportunity for traditional publishers to say, you don't have those concerns at the New York Times, right? So they are able to push that as a safe space. I don't think most digital advertising is pretty worthless, and the digital advertising that is next to fake news is even more worthless. I don't think that a lot of brands are like, oh wow, we want to get these people who don't know anything to, to buy our products. It doesn't really, I think most brands would be happy if they had a way to ensure that their product advertising never appeared next to those sites. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they want to pay 10 times as much to put it in the New York Times. Um, but I don't worry too much about the advertising side there because I think they have a real interest, at least most of the advertising is a real interest in, in keeping that act as clean as they can. They don't want to be blamed for Trump either. Well, thank you for being here. It's great uh, knowing you uh, outside of the Newman Lab news area. Oh, great. And um, in, the, in a world where the um, homepage is dead, or it's beginning to come oh, nice work. and um, where disruptive technology is all about crossing the chasm, I think one of the the, the, the most important announcement at, at the Apple conference it was unclear. Un, uh, or we, we were thinking about the expensive new phone. But Tim Cook said, and now your Apple TV 4K is, uh, since it's sitting by your TV all the time, you are going to be able to control your all your smart devices through C. So we're starting to see this um, new interface is no interface. Mm -hmm. The smart cars or self-driving cars. So it's, it's the beginning of having no devices to interact. How can someone monetize the world, your environment? Is it, someone doing it? It is a really tough question. Um, that's one of the things that gives me a little bit of pause for things like the Amazon Echo and voice interfaces and other, other things like that because a news story, there are functionally an infinite number of news stories published every day, right? You're only going to consume X of those. How do you find those, right? You know, if you're, if you're a Twitter user, it's because the people you follow on Twitter are sharing those links. That's one filter. If you're a Facebook user, it's a similar one. If you're a devoted New York Times reader and you go to nytimes.com three times a day, that's how you get it. But whatever those paths are to content, it's a lot less clear to me what those paths are when it's, you're just talking to a device. Right? Uh, on one hand, the current way that the Echo works and Alexa works is you have to say, I want the Washington Post to be sending me news updates. Right? So that's a, that's a pro-brand way of thinking about things. Um, but nonetheless, the Washington Post produces 600 stories a day, or whatever the number is, and the ones that are interesting to me are probably not going to be the ones interesting to someone else. So how do you customize and curate that, that feed in a way that it still feels native to the medium? but incentivizes the kind of broad-based news production that we sort of need from a, from a civic perspective. And you know, I, as I said in there, I, I, I'm optimistic that something like augmented reality is going to be a big deal in five or 10 years. But I'm not entirely sure how news fits into that. Um, because it is another case uh, where the, the technology companies who own the platform are going to have every sort of control that, that they want to have. One, one point I sometimes make about social networks is that, is that uh, Facebook and Twitter were both born in a web browser, right? They were born in a web browser on a laptop. And that meant that they were part of the open web, which meant that links were a first class citizen, right? So that encouraged them to send traffic to the web. Look at Instagram, which was born on a phone. Look at Snapchat, which was born on a phone. Instagram doesn't let you put any link to anything unless you buy an ad or you go to your profile. 
Snapchat goes even further and again says, don't just, we don't want your content, make special content just for us. Essentially, the, the older social networks, Facebook and Twitter, were sort of grandfathered into something like the web, but new platforms are much more willing to define those boundaries in ways that are not particularly pro-publisher. And then you go to the next step and you remove the screen. Uh, it's scarier still. Um, yeah, I, I wish I had a, a good optimistic answer on how that's going to work, but I think it's a really, really big problem. Whatever platform comes next, it's going to be a platform built by large technology companies. And large technology companies that are going to be much more comfortable than their predecessors putting up wall guards.